back again. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to our wonderful panelists. Thanks for joining us. Um, oh, by the way, I'm not just checking my phone. I actually have my notes on my phone, so hopefully you can uh, be okay with that. Um, okay, so, so we're talking here about DAOs and Web3 investing, obviously a fairly broad topic. So um, just to kind of break things down a little bit, I think like there are four different angles that I wanted to kind of um, use to try and, 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 and use as a thread of the discussion. Um, the number one is investing in Web2 companies that are enabling Web3. Um, so that, that might be a company like Coinbase. Um, investing directly into DAOs by purchasing tokens. Web3, uh, Web3 driven companies enabling Web3. Um, investing as a DAO, so pooling money together and making decisions in a, in a decentralized fashion. And then finally, investing in NFTs, so buying unique digital assets, um, hoping that their assets will, will grow in value. So those are kind of like main categories I'm going I'm to run through. Um, Brett, I wanted to start with you. Uh, the, the first one, obviously, investing in Web2 companies, enable, enabling Web3. I know that um, Initialize invests in, in Coinbase. So I'd love to just start by, if you could just tell us like, the story of the investment in Coinbase. Like, how did you meet them? How did that, work? How did that flow work? And then we'll, we'll, we'll come to you guys after that. Sure, yeah. I mean, thanks, thanks a lot for having me. Um, you know, it, was, it was actually before my time at Initialize, Initialize but uh, we were founded by this guy named Gary Tan, who was a partner at Y Combinator. Um, and so, you know, while he was working there, he, he met uh, Brian Armstrong through his network and helped get him into YC and then worked with him throughout the batch. And, you know, I think that he, back then it, there was some still a lot of uncertainty around Bitcoin and sort of, I mean, it was just Bitcoin, so not really crypto generally. But, um, you know, they just they saw the way he was executing and, and immediately after YC's demo day, Initialize invested. Um, and then from there, like, you know, they, they, they kept working with Brian. Um, and the story goes that they were, they were, you know, the problem they were having was they were running out of Bitcoin. So they, uh, so that's when the initialized sort of doubled down and it, it became obvious that like whatever was going on with Coinbase was, was meaningful and something we wanted to be a part of. Nice. And, and um, Casey, I know that um, uh, Paradigm invests in OpenSea, so I'd love to know a little bit more about um, how you guys have worked with OpenSea, how the investment there came about, and the, the story of that would be great. Yeah, similarly, it was a long-standing relationship, and we had okay. known the OpenSea team during the bear market, and we're always really impressed by their tenacity to just stay with it. A lot of teams had tried to make NFT marketplaces in the past in, in different cycles, and ultimately, before product market fit, decided to pivot, and the OpenSea team has been really steadfast in that, and when we saw the rise in the market. It was really clear that we wanted to partner with them and help them build. Great, and, and um, Maria, just kind of uh, shifting to that, that next category, I know that you guys have just raised a, a, big, a big fund. Uh, I think it's $1 billion, right? Um, split in, in, in two, so you're gonna invest in companies that are enabling Web3 and then also buying tokens, a, a chunk of that, maybe 400 million, I think was just set, set aside to, to invest directly into tokens. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how, you, like how the decision making works, how the team is split? across those two things, uh, that'd be great as well. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, so, so for the billion dollars that we raised, actually both of the funds are able to invest in both um, yeah. equity and tokens. Um, the way we think about it is that um, there's a set of, there's a, there's a set of really early stage things now where there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of um, which way they should turn. Should they have a token network? Not everything needs a token. Um, or should it be equity-based? And so, of course, there's a set of things where, you know, early on teams pivot and teams are really early. Um, we, we, we kind of allow founders the flexibility to, um, to explore both avenues. Um, and then later stage things in crypto are a little bit strange, right? Um, later stage things, the company can be still, or the, the protocol itself or the community can still be very young, but the token could be live. Um, and so, um, you know, and so, so we have the opportunity to kind of participate in things that we see that are working that are on the market already as well. Um, so we, we can kind of participate in both spectrums. And where this is really helpful for especially kind of Web3 companies or Web3 protocols is say you do have something that is very early stage um, that perhaps um, uh, you, can, you can generate yield using that protocol. 
Um, so if you are very, you know, if you're bullish or you want to kind of double down on, on a team that you really believe in and a community you really believe in, then the ability to use your own liquidity to then generate yield, mm -hmm. um, to generate more of those tokens um, is something that um, we're able to do as well with our structure. And um, obviously, if you're, if you're investing in a very early stage company um, that has not yet done a token sale, but they, they're, they're planning to initiate one, you guys, um, can you just explain how a, a simple agreement for future tokens works as, to put, as opposed to a safe? So the traditional safe com you know, coming out of, of, of YC, uh, something like that. If you could just explain the differences, I think that would help people in the audience as well understand how that, how that works when, when the token sale eventually happens. Yeah, um, there's definitely a lot of, I think, regulatory and legal ambiguity around that. Um, the structure I'm seeing more now is less, um, less a SAFT, so less the team selling tokens, um, but more a safe with a token warrant. And so the warrant is the ability to purchase tokens later on that the company may own, um, but that is part of a decentralized network. Um, and so the way that we kind of talk to um, our founders and, and a lot of early founders feel this similarly is again, you know, you, you don't want to introduce a token too early. Um, in many ways, once a token, you know, this kind of, the token launch is something that can only happen once. Yeah. Um, and also it really muddles the story. If you have a product that doesn't have product market fit, but you, <laughs> you launch a token and all of a sudden people are, are acting kind of speculatively around the token, it, it, that's something that can be short-lived. Um, and so you want to kind of get to a point where, you know, you build something that you know can provide value um, and that the tokens are really an incentive system built on top of something to make it more sustainable, mm -hmm. not, hey, our, our, our product is... Um, is not seeing any any sort of product market fit, not seeing any sort of traction. Let's add a token to it and see if people will come to that. That's that's really you know not the right way to approach things. And again, um, there were a few people in the audience just when we were doing the announcement a second ago or ten minutes ago who said they they didn't really they hadn't really engaged in Web3 that much. Um, I think it would be helpful to maybe explain like an example of maybe Casey, I'll, I'll bring this one to you. An example of what a good token sale looks like. So. You talked a little bit about when you've hit product market fit, you, you, you might decide that a token distribution is, is, um, is the right approach for you. Why would a company make that decision? And um, what, does it, what would a good token sale look like? Maybe, maybe uh, some examples would be good as well. Yeah, sure. And I just want to underline what Maria said and that a token can actually be a huge deterrent to reaching product market fit. And yeah. I think we're really coming to digest that this year and, and last year. And I really just encourage any founders in the audience to think about, think about a token as an add-on, a means to an end versus an end. Um, but so what a token sale looks like, there's actually really good resources on this. My friend Lauren at Pantera just published one, and we have one at Paradigm as well on what um, like a standard division looks like. But it, it's going to involve both the cap tables, so the insiders, as well as usually inflationary rewards, as well as the team, which can be counted as the cap table or separately. There's also community, which is obviously paramount to this industry, so that's always part of the token sale. But the, the percentages are really, I would say, while flexible, you can see trends over the last few years of where they're heading. So I'll actually, I don't know, I don't know if I had to, how to distribute this article, but it would be the best resource hands down for this. In terms of concrete examples, um, one of the tokens that we've worked really closely with is obviously Uniswap, which we seeded and, and incubated at Paradigm, more or less. And I think when we design that, the, the, always the goal in mind is sustainability and durability of usage. So we kind of take that as the end goal and then can work backwards to decide what percentages make sense given the community construction. Um, but yeah, all of, the, all of like the token supply information is available online. So I don't know if it'd be helpful to walk through numbers, but that's the high level. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing the resources. Yeah. Um, Brett, what, like, a question that I would also like to ask, I think probably a lot of people will be wondering is, how, how different is the experience as an investor between kind of supporting, you know, post, post investment supporting a Web2 company versus a Web3 company? Like how different are the requirements of a company, of the investor? What do they expect from you? Yeah, I mean, we, we tend to think that a lot of it is pretty similar. I mean, I think um, perhaps, you know, <laughs> we're, 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 uh, we're a generalist fund, you know, we're not specifically crypto focused. So 
Um, you know, that, that probably uh, factors into our attitude about it. But a lot of the basic uh, sort of blocking and tackling of, of building a startup and building a team um, and organizing and getting a product out is similar. Um, I guess, you know, what, what stands out as being the most different are, are thinking deeply through token economics and token schemes and um, token-driven community, which is a slightly different um, uh, way to build community and, and think about it. Okay. Yeah, I think diligence is different, but then support is quite similar. How, how, how is diligence different? Oh, it's, it's entirely different because we're still deciding our fundamentals in the space, and it's such a nascent category still that when you think about growth investing, it's, it's, it's a totally different ballpark um, than equity investing and Web2 investing. So then that trickles down to the seed where you really have usually little traction, and the traction you are looking for is publicly available versus like asking for data requests, you go to Dune, for example, and that's like changes the entire game because you're able to track these companies over time or these projects over time and observe on-chain activity. And then by the time you're having conversations, you usually have a stronger conviction than in Web 2 where you say, oh, can I have your numbers? Can I have your metrics? Yeah. And also, I mean, also you're, you're underwriting to a token model, which is like not well understood, right? right? Like we have these things, and they're still memes in their own right of like revenue multiples for like SaaS companies, but they're, they're relatively understood. Like, even though there's a bunch of models for how to value tokens, like empirically, none of them actually match up to anything. Yeah, So absolutely. you're just kind of like finger in the air. Uh, you know, what's a comp? How, how might this trade? How, how does it play out with, I mean, obviously the market itself is also, you know, the broader market changes so quickly and it moves so fast. So how do you keep abreast of the changes as you're doing due diligence on these different companies? You know, is it the due diligence itself that is kind of the market analysis because that is the frontier? Or are you doing kind of, you know, do you have specific people who are kind of just more broadly analyzing the market and trying to kind of educate people internally who are diving into the companies? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's so funny. I, when I entered crypto in 2018, it felt like, oh my goodness, this is such an information deluge. I feel like I'm drinking from this fire hose. How can I possibly keep on top of crypto? And that, that feeling has just grown exponentially. Um, and it forces specialization, I think, mm. because in 2018, my question was, how can I possibly keep on top of crypto? And I think as I've developed specialization in the space, I look at a lot of DAOs and NFTs now. My question now is, how can I possibly keep on top of you know, NFTs and DAOs? Not, never mind that there's also decentralized finance, that there's decentralized infrastructure, that there's new privacy solutions, that there's bridges and interoperability. And then you know, every single layer one has its own ecosystem. Um, so I, I, I definitely, you know, I, I think that's something that a lot of people in crypto feel, which is this information explosion. Um, and I think, practically speaking, the way that we've organized our team and, and kind of our thesis in the very beginning is that um, for, a, you know, cri crypto enables, crypto is kind of this paradigm shift. And with paradigm shifts, there's an opportunity for new types of venture capitalists to come aboard. And so for us, we've really, we've, you know, we have four investment partners. Um, everyone has either started a company before or has been an early operator. Um, everyone has an engineering background and writes code. Um, and we have a large engineering team as well. Um, you know, about half of our team are engineers. Um, we have two designers on board. And so I think the way that we look at how to approach this space is also very different. It's not so much. Um, you know, it, it's it's not so much kind of networking and, and going to happy hours as much as like having having engineers sitting in Discord, um, looking at on-chain transactions and looking at on-chain data, um, being able to build data infrastructure to process what's happening in the space. So as an example, um, we've built internal infrastructure to crawl almost the entirety of GitHub to understand open source development in crypto. Um, so, you know, we've crawled, I think, over 160 million commits to understand how many developers are working open source in, in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, in Solana, in Near, in Avalanche, um, and how many new developers are coming in. And, and what's interesting about crypto is all of this, so much of it is open source, and almost everything is on chain, that this data is actually open and available. And I think it's really just, you know, you, you need the infrastructure and the engineering um, ability to build these systems. I know that um, just backstage when we were talking, we said we, we talking about regulation is a difficult one. Uh, you can't always dig into the details, but um, 
kind of on, on what you said there, uh, you know, I imagine because so much of what you're, you're, you're engaging in here is like on the frontier, there's a huge part of this, which is, you know, where is the regulation going to go? And you've seen, you know, companies like A16Z creating, you know, essentially like writing documentation of like how they think it should look and kind of almost trying to lobby, I guess, for, for where they think, the, you know, how, how, to, how to enable these companies and how to enable this opportunity, how to, how to incentivize people to build things in the US. Um, how does that work internally? Maybe uh, initialize, do you guys get involved in, um, to, you know, to what extent do you have people who are kind of involved in the regulatory side and specializing in that? Yeah, we don't. I guess we don't have a big depth, especially there. I mean, it, it is it is a, it is still a bit of a murky picture. So it's something we really. I mean, we really stress to our founders to find find good counsel and, and trust them and, and be a part of sort of the industry dialogue around these issues. Um, and, and you know, some of the um, you know the sort of contortions that have grown up. But, yeah. Casey, what about you guys at, at Paradigm? How, how's that working? I know that you're sort of a newer your firm, but um, yeah, how are you thinking about that? No, we're heavily investing in regulatory and policy right now, and we actually have expanded our team quite a bit this last year, and it's becoming one of our, I guess, like core value propositions for founders, because we can really help on that front now, and I'm super excited about it, because I think there's, there, there has to be increased attention towards it, um, and it's a really, really important topic to have support for. And what do, you, what do you guys think, as the world shifts more towards, you know, I guess in terms of proportion of companies starting, you know, working within Web3, either enabling Web3 or, or being Web3 driven, um, what do you think will happen to the most traditional funds that, that kind of move too slowly? Uh, I'll keep that one on you, Casey. <laughs> uh, well, I used to work for a Web2 fund, and I love that fund very much, call out to Bessemer. Um, but I think that, I think that Crypto is a paradigm shift. I don't think this is like a step, a little step function. Like this yeah. is a radically new way to look at the world, a radically new way to develop projects and companies, and therefore it just uh, requires a new lens of thinking entirely. I think that we're going to see increased competition from Web2 funds coming in and generalist funds to try to, you know, work with the best founders. But I, but I think it's a personal choice of if you want to do like a breath for search or a depth for search. And I think that. Um, that's, that's the way I see it. I'm curious what Maria thinks. Yeah. Well, I think, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I do think eventually even, I, I agree that, you know, as, as I mentioned, I think even the way that we're structuring the team is different because of, because of how fundamentally different crypto is. Um, but even still, you know, I, I, I see a lot of investment DAOs today and, and, and DAOs in general that may not have come together for the purposes of investment, but has the ability to accrue this large treasury yeah. and has the ability to not only allocate that capital, um, but has the network to be able to find talent um, and to be able to be, you know, distributed all around the world to be able to gather that talent. And I think, you know, DAOs themselves can be very disruptive to the VC model as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I know that you guys invested in Syndicate. Uh, I think it would be helpful for you to explain what Syndicate is and how it, how it works. Maybe compare it to something like AngelList, which people may, may know more about. Um, and then we can kind of dive into that because I've got questions on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So... You know, I think there's a question in terms of there's there's theoretically what a DAO can be, which is what I, I think of it as um, uh, as ability for a group of people all over the world without knowing each other to be able to allocate capital in different ways. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of like a really simplistic way is like almost giving a subreddit, um, you know, a, a, a treasury and the ability to allocate that capital. Um, but I think that still needs at some point in time to be tethered to the real world. There's certainly a lot of DAOs today that are, um, you know, not registered entities in some some capacity. But um, for a lot of DAOs, I think DAO members still live in jurisdictions where they have to answer to some sort of government and some sort of regulatory process. And so DAOs do need some sort of legal backing. And there's a plethora of choices between, you know, do we want to, where do we want um, where do we want to be regulated? How do we want to be structured? Um, can, we, can we accept all sorts of members or do our members have to be accredited investors? And so I think there's a set of, A, there's kind of like a set of 
legal questions, which at the end of the day boils down to a bunch of templates that like if you're, you know, if you're trying to do this type of activity, this is the set of things that make sense. If you're trying to do this type of activity, then this is the set of um, kind of regulatory constraints that you should be playing with. Um, secondarily, I think there's a lot of operational support as well, not only thinking about taxes, but thinking about getting, um, getting your treasury up and running, how people can contribute into the treasury, um, again, with conjunction of, with the real world um, and within, the, within those constraints. And so Syndicate is effectively a platform for DAOs to launch. Um, which I think gets into really, really interesting territory um, because uh, kind of with, with DAOs as, as kind of new entities and if you think of DAOs as um, their own, you know, almost like self-governing structures, I think there's a really interesting network that's emerging as well um, where if you, are the, if you are the launch pad for DAOs, um, then there's a lot of interesting social and, and there's a lot of kind of social, interesting social connections um, that you can kind of make within those DAOs as well. I mean, a, a lot of DAOs that I've, you know, a few, quite a few DAOs I've seen have, have started very organically, and I don't think necessarily even people have been thinking intentionally, like, we are creating a company here, so we must think about, you know, this, this, and this. And if you would, if you were creating a, a traditional startup. So maybe, Brett, I mean, how, do, how does one think about that if you started a, a relatively organic subreddit, essentially, you know, a, a, an online community, at what point does a company think, hey, we're getting some traction in what we're trying to create here or the community we're bringing together. Um, we need to start, you know, almost like retro, retroactively creating a legal structure or not creating a legal structure. Uh, we've seen some problems with DAOs who haven't created legal structure and they're kind of having, you know, uh, regulatory issues. So where, at what point should, should a, a group of people who are creating something like a DAO think about that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a hard question, I guess, because like it starts with the fact that like DAO is such a broad term, right? Like it's not, um, you know, not everything that that is created as a DAO, you know, is meant to be something like a high growth startup or investable in that manner. And so, um, so I mean, I, I guess I mean, there's there's kind of a rough analog to like to to normal startups. Like if you start, you know, if you start some sort of like LLC that's like a consulting company, you're gonna have to go back and redo your docs to take venture investment. Um, so I think I think it's I think it's similar to those lines. I guess the that that sort of just addressing it organically, like at a point where you know we've decided that you know we we just we built it out to do something cool, and now it seems more like a business. Let's like retool. Um, I imagine there is a little bit more risk because it's so poorly defined what you were doing before and how it how it uh, related to compliance regimes. So, but. I don't know. I, I don't have. I don't have a super crisp answer about that, but um, oh, it's a difficult, it's pretty question. ad hoc, purposely difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I know we've only got five minutes left, so a, cup, a couple more questions um, I really want to ask. Um, there, there's obviously like the rise of the solo capitalist um, that we could we can kind of touch on. Some people, you know, starting building their own audiences, writing newsletters, maybe having a podcast. People start following them. They then capitalize on the growth of an audience to then raise a fund because they're getting deal flow. And then, you know, for example, the Not Boring Newsletter, uh, you know, I think they now have a $20, $20 million uh, fund. Um, how does the growth of things like that um, affect larger firms with, with big funds, um, you know, in a, in a sort of collaborative and, and maybe competitive um, environment? Uh, I know that obviously um, they can move more quickly um, perhaps, but it just I'm, I'm interested in sort of how, how you guys in, at the larger funds think about these the rise of the solo capitalist. Uh, Casey, maybe take that one. Yeah, so it's definitely real, and it's definitely a dynamic that's more recent than not. And what we've seen is, especially in crypto, the opportunity to create wealth is right there. And what happens is, you know, these these solo angels or like these micro funds are able to amass enough capital where it doesn't really make sense to go to a fund. They rather deploy their own capital. And then the pitch to founders is less dilution, yeah. less of a mess, faster closing process, and oh, I'm like your friend and user, because they're operators usually on the floor doing something between investing and operating, which is an increasing trend and something that I have a lot of experience with myself. Um, so then from our shoes, we think, it, so it, it really depends on the stage. Like that's the first thing I would say. For pre-seed, it's obviously a competitive dynamic where these super angels come in and, and can convince and sell founders on doing this shorter, faster, less dilutive process. 
Um, for later stages, of course, it, it's less of a concern, but so like I'll focus on the early stage. Sure. The way that we think about it is what is gonna be best for the founder, and that's always the lens that we take. And sometimes the super angels are incredibly synergistic to us. They have like exposure or access and distribution to networks that we don't, and we love bringing them into the rounds. And in other cases, we think that it's actually been, in some cases, a mistake where these super angels will, um, again, like sell, sell the dilution, but then they're actually not there to help build the business on the ground floor, and they end up coming back wanting more support in things such as talent recruiting, uh, mechanism design, policy, all of these things that, you know, the reason venture capital firms exist. So I don't think it's a, I don't think there's like a one fit all model, but I will say like it is definitely real. We deal with it constantly, and it's really interesting to think about what venture capital is gonna look like in 10 years due to that dynamic. Yeah, I was going to sort of finish up with maybe a question that each of you can answer uh, on that topic. So yeah. what, what excites you most about the future of investing? Well, I think it's the democratization of it. I think that that's like one of the core tenets of crypto right now and the fact that DAOs are kind of like spearheading right now is enabling access in different ways. If that's through tokens or through pooling capital with your friends and using anything from a Discord plus a chat to anything to like a Cayman Island entity, like, you know, DAOs do, that's a very nebulous term and we don't fully know what it means, but there, I mean, there's just so many different types, but the point is like access is this um, threaded throughout crypto and I think that's what gets me really excited. Brent? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, sort of, I don't know about the investing specifically, but like crypto generally, I, I think, I just think that like, you know, like all, you know, all monetary assets are going to become digital on some time scale, and so we work backwards from there. Um, and what it and what it means for everyone to it will then it will it will normalize that everyone has wallets, and what it means if everyone has wallets, um, it just like enables so many things, especially around like self sovereignty and privacy. That that's that's the stuff I really look forward to. Yeah. Um, I think we're finally at a at an era where it's like we take the internet for granted and we take being online for granted. Um, and we spend half, if not more, ha more than half of our waking hours online. And I think COVID has really accelerated that, that as well. And so I feel like we're at the precipice of the digital world becoming more important than the physical one. And crypto is really, you know, it is really kind of the underlying infrastructure for the digital world. What does it mean to own something digitally? What does it mean to transfer value digitally? What does it mean for value transfer to not only happen between people or even corporations or organizations, but rather like one smart contract to another? Like what if it's just one, you know, one computer talking to another and, and making transactions? Um, and I think that that is what's really exciting to me is that we're, we're really shifting into a world where being digital is more important than being physical and how is that going to fundamentally change the way we interact and, and kind of the organizations that we have today. Yeah, that's certainly what I found. I think basically every day is an adventure, right? There's just so much changing. It's just like the, the f most fun place to spend time. So yeah, um, yeah. I, I think we a good place to finish up. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Of big round of applause, please. Thank you.